The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Stoa. My name is Raven Connolly. Um, I'm a host here at the STOA, and the STOA is a digital campfire where we gather to go here in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this moment. And this is an event um, that I've been co-hosting with Rachel Haywire, who will be joining us shortly, uh, called the Philosopher Queens. Uh, and we have been discussing the metaphysical and kind of like imminent qualities of the feminine. What are the rising feminine archetypes right now? Um, how are we understanding ourselves as women? And what all of the kind of uh, difficult questions there are about addressing those issues. And today we are joined with uh, Nina Power, who is a cultural critic, philosopher, ex-academic. Um, she's written a lot about feminism. And I'm super excited to have Nina, I, I was in her course on Bataille that she just did with Justin Murphy. So um, very excited to have you here with us today, Nina. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I wanted to start just by like framing the situation because from, from my point of view, there seems to be a lot of conflict around what, what a woman is, who a woman is. And this to me seems to be an issue of the kind of symptomatic uh, liberation of, the, of a woman. You know, the fact that we have intervention into our biology that allows us to choose our kind of reproductive condition. We can move into the workforce. There's all of these kind of unprecedented conditions that have been afforded to us by the kind of techno-capitalist world that we've inherited. And it seems like in the culture, we're seeing the symptoms of that with this uh, very, you know, uh, contentious conversations around who is a woman, who gets to be in women's spaces, what is it to be a woman, and also the contested kind of relationship of that term to biology and to sex. And so I wanted to start off the conversation with that very base and basic question and to kind of see what is your diagnosis? Where do you start when thinking about what is a woman? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's it's obviously an extremely kind of contentious and emotional topic and, you know, very politically fraught and has been the subject of a lot of kind of, uh, I don't know, often quite vicious um, arguments. I mean, I think my starting point when you're, you know, introducing this question is, is, is almost to think in terms of a kind of recent history and to think about this question almost generationally, like, you know, I would, I'm Generation X like born in the 70s and you know and I think what I feel like we've seen in in my lifetime at you know and, and many other people's I suppose is a kind of fracturing of these terms in certain ways so I mean it was I think the second wave idea that there was you know sexual difference and there were men and women and that gender was this kind of social force that was kind of negatively imposed from the outside and it would kind of and it would be about certain expectations that would kind of uh, attach themselves to sex, as it were, right? So the idea that if you were born female, then you were supposed to be this kind of person. And if you're born male, you're supposed to be this kind of person, you know? And so gender was this kind of external force, but sex wasn't kind of contested in the same way as it was today. It was just a kind of fact, a kind of brute biological fact, right? You were born male or female. And, but actually there was a kind of existentialist dimension, which was kind of like to say, but that tells you nothing about how you're actually going to live your life. You know, it's up to you in a way. So I think the second wave um, actually had quite a kind of uh, trickle down effect on the way in which that idea permeate, permeated, however, uh, gently in education and culture. And then I think that kind of shifted something kind of happened in the last 10 years and, and I you know I, I wrote this book in 2009 called One Dimensional Woman which which is just a kind of short polemic really about the kind of uh, consumer feminism and it was a kind of against the way in which capitalism seemed to be kind of trying to integrate women into the workforce and into this kind of capitalist subject and you know it was a kind of Marcuse against the modern world <laughs> a kind of left refusal um, of of that um, idea that feminism and capitalism were 
um, compatible. But it's interesting looking at that now because I didn't discuss this question of gender at all. I basically took it for granted that we knew what we were talking about when we were talking about men and women. Um, you know, and that what we were talking about was were the cultural and economic aspects of how that played out. But it, but the kind of the terms themselves weren't in contestation. So something definitely happened in that sort of 10 year period in which I would say there are at least kind of two definitions of gender at work, you know, one of which was this kind of second wave, definitely the idea that gender was a kind of imposition. And, and ultimately, that was something that needed to be abolished or eliminated. You know, the, the second wave position is really that gender was a negative thing. You know, these expectations were bad for both boys and girls and men and women. And actually, what you wanted to do was expand, uh, you know, the expressive possibilities of sexuality and uh, and and habits and hobbies and, and love and all these other things. And, and so people should be able to, you know, do whatever they wanted, kind of regardless of sex, as it were. Um, but then I think it's it's become more obvious that there's a kind of second uh, antagonistic concept of gender, which doesn't ma doesn't work with the other one, and it and it's kind of tried to replace it in lots of ways, which is this idea perhaps of a kind of gender as an inner feeling, you know, of something that is um, a, an identity. And I think we didn't, I you know, my generation didn't grow up with that idea of identity, and this touches on this question more broadly, not just to do with sex. But, you know, the the idea that one is one's identity as opposed to what one does or, you know, that I think we were much more used to this idea of becoming rather than being something. Um, and, I, you know, there's a big, a big question about the kind of technology, you know, what does it mean to kind of live in such a, a, se a separated way in the mind body sort of split or the kind of image feeling of self split online where people are kind of constantly, you know, there's a felt need to present oneself as a thing, you know, as a kind of circulating identity uh, in this kind of playground, um, which which oddly seems to have kind of become very fixed, um, you know, and, and people become very territorial and propri proprietorial about identity, um, which, you know, I'm, I'm very against. And I think it doesn't it doesn't make sense for for someone of <laughs> my generation. To think like that um, at all and, and if we had an identity it was something like a kind of shared uselessness you know like everyone was a bit rubbish and that was quite good and I think in the 90s there was a kind of humor was much more about like everyone and everything can be mocked and there was like in a nice way you know and that, that everybody was kind of um, yeah I mean potentially uh, could laugh at oneself and I think something like that's become lost it's become very people have become very rigid and uh, possessive um, about this. So, I mean, to, to go back to your question, I just think, you know, like we, there is, I think it, it's not controversial to say that there are at least these two definitions of gender that are incompatible and that this is partly at the root of what's going on in all of these debates about who, who can and can't call themselves a woman or what does woman mean? I mean, the contemporary definition seems to be, if you ask who is a woman, it's not, you know, that, uh, part of humanity that has large gametes, right, <laughs> as opposed to small gametes, which would be the biological definition, it would be anyone who says they are a woman is a woman. But of course, this is a circular definition, right, so there's no content to that, it's simply a kind of assertion, um, and they, that fits with a kind of very uh, assertoric, definitive notion of language, that language is this kind of possessive identitarian object that one can simply claim and pluck out of the air, which is points to a broader shift in language and language use and concept use in general, which isn't necessarily great, I would say. Mm, I would love to segue from this subject to an incredible poem that Nina Power wrote. It's from her the platform, so just all of you took this amazing I piece of wire, my co-host, by the way. <laughs> I was changing my top. Raven, if you witnessed me trying to find the right top, and then I tried to find the right Zoom room. So here we are. Raven is the older philosopher queen today for being mature. Um, and I'm the young philosopher queen who reads the poem. Here this is fine by Nina Power. The man I am, which one? 
The one you love, the good one. Me without you, quietly, happily. What isn't here, no concern. What you can't see, the darkness. What words can't say, if you are. Zero, what escapes? Pick your jailer. Jerks a gesture. You can go it alone. At the outside, nature is two tired pilgrims. The tower is burning. To the tower came, the sky is falling. This one to that one, we are not the same. I'm smarter than you, undoubtedly. They answer. Does it matter? They decide to stay the night. Great. <laughs> yeah, it's a very different register of things. Thank you for reading that, um, Rachel. I like your uh, philosophical castle. <laughs> I, yeah, having this book exchange with you after the elixir salon made me so happy because I've been wanting to do work with you in one way or another. Um, you're on Justin Murphy show, and it's because there's a lot of just interesting women, and and this sector, you know, of the, this like IDW intellectual artist world, I I would call it. Um, and me and Raven, we've always been just like it's not about fitting a quota, you know, and getting more women. It's about finding women like us, you know. And that's why when I released the manifesto, when Raven asked you guys to do the panel, we're like, yeah. We were going to do this panel to bring women who get it that are on this level, this heightened state of being. And we are happy to be graced with your presence here. I had a question for you um, about the famous, you, I'm sure you get asked a lot, um, but what was it to work? What was it like to, to work with Vidu? What is it like to work with him? To work with Baju. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I mean, I guess this was a long time ago. Uh, now, when I was like a master's student, um, yeah, he's an extremely affable man, right? He's a kind of like jolly giant. <laughs> <laughs> he's kind of like really. Uh, he has an amazing laugh. It sounds like kind of uh, a void uh, falling down a drain, and it sort mm -hmm. of like oh, kind of implodes <laughs> on itself. And he's um. He's, He's a really very happy man somehow. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he's, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's interesting because I, I suppose that, that now seems like quite a long time ago. To, I was translating all of Baju's work on um, Samuel Beckett and mm -hmm. working with Alberto Toscano, who I was in a relationship mm -hmm. at that time for, for a decade and we're still friends. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I was kind of very committed to this project of translating kind of lots of the contemporary French uh, mm -hmm. thinkers um, who were talking about ideas of, I mean, well, love in Badu's case in relation to, to Beckett. And uh, he, had, he has this very platonic reading of Samuel Beckett in which Beckett is kind of reducing uh, uh, being to its kind of fundamental dimensions. It's a very kind of like purified image of Beckett. And I was very drawn to this idea and I, I love uh, Samuel Beckett so much particularly how it is in the later Beckett where the prose becomes kind of completely um, uh, primordial and you know like you use this word uh, like sonic a lot like this idea of a kind of earthy um, yeah, vital yeah. Is, um, primitive and that that brings me to the tie naturally I've been reading this secret society transmission but um, I, I'm just in awe of these people all getting together to have these talks in nature with one another and to meet minds that were so similar when there is traditionally so much fighting on the left, but to form like this higher, you know, um, mental, spiritual connection um, with the Bataille Society. And I'm curious to hear what you think about the Bataille Society. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, like this idea of a secret society, I think is that like really, really important, um, incredibly um, interesting on all kinds of levels. 
I mean, I think our current situation, you know, like something like this, for example, is kind of post-academic or para-academic or, you know, uh, parallel to in any kind of formal institutional structure. And I think, you know, this is the world we're kind of heading into. The course I, I ran with Justin Murphy on Bataille was a kind of, you know, absolutely this sort of, you know, experimental thing. We're both former academics who left for various reasons, you know, partly to do with the desire for freedom, partly because we were getting kind mm. of in trouble uh, mm. for other reasons. And, you know, I mean, to, to try to do these new things. I mean, at the same time, there's obviously a kind of huge tension brought up by figures like Agamben in his, you know, actually very perhaps hyperbolic criticism mm. of Zoom. You know, he's kind of comparing the use of Zoom to almost kind of like fascist, uh, um, modes of being, you know, as if as if we are, you know, what we're turning our back on when we're doing things like this, uh, you know, what we're losing is the proximity, is the kind of social interaction, you know, the the face to face, mm. um, and I think that that must also be borne in mind, you know, that there is whatever happens, well, you know, obviously I think it's better that these things happen that they don't, but they can't, they're not the same, and they can't replace let's say an intimate you know social scene yeah. and so the question of the secret society i think whether we're talking about online or off you know clearly uh, i mean what's what strikes me about what bataille and the others and kozowski and others were up to at that time is trying to push the limits of what's possible within a kind of agreement so the kind of the idea yes. that you have a loyalty and a bond and whatever happens within the society and it, it's not even about doing scandalous things necessarily people get hung up on the human sacrifice idea but uh -huh. actually, I, don't think that's the, I don't think that's the interesting aspect of what they were doing mm. i think what they were trying to do is actually push a kind of collective thought a sort of mm. um group mental process who's um, esoteric aspects had to be protected in order for the exoteric mm. to to then be able to thrive. I mean, because Asifal was also kind of ex exoteric, you know, as in an outward looking um, thing as well with the mag with the journal, you know. And I and I do think mm. I mean Raven gave a very nice talk in the Bataille course about how, for example, like marriage could be conceived as a secret society. And I really like this idea, you know, because it actually kind of um, repositions something that we might criticize as a traditional structure as something that's kind of you know oppressive and you know should be transcended and it reposes it as something potentially much more like intriguing and um mm. intimate and secret and i actually really i thought that was really uh interesting and i mm. I, I kind of agree i do think you know that that need for the uh the the private and the kind of uh, esoteric whether we're thinking with others you know and mm. who we're talking to and what we're talking about. I mean, you know, I, the older I get, the more I value um, an ongoing dialogue with certain people who I respect intellectually. I find this is mm. one of the most kind of beautiful things mm. about remaining alive. <laughs> you know, these kind of- I, Wow, yeah, I would actually wanna know who is your favorite famous or not famous modern philosopher? Um, what you, person was somebody I respect as a as a thinker. Modern modern thinker. Um, yeah. Sorry, someone's just asking who spoke of marriage. Well, it was Raven who's hosting one of the co-hosts. Um, Steph. It was so Raven. You can probably fill in Steph at yeah. some point. Yeah, about yeah, this idea. Me. That was my. Uh, that's what I'm working on, kind of developing that idea. Uh, using and, and also thinking about uh, issues that I think even your poem brings up, which is like a kind of alienation and of connection to nature. And you just brought this up in the sense of like proximity, right? Because all of these uh, ways in which that is particularly now we are finding ourselves in intimate relationships with one another are mediated through this, uh, this technological force, which is inherently manipulative. It's an it's inherently withdrawn manipulative uh, entity that we are interacting with and interfacing with in order to have these most precious uh, aspects of the human experience. And that's why I was thinking um, in the sense of like, we've lost, we've lost so much already in terms of the ground of the human experience that we have to go back to the most basic form of bonding and secrecy, which is the dyad. The yeah. dyad is the most basic form. I mean, you have the internal world, obviously, um, which can be your own secret realm, 
But in a sense, like, at least from my perspective, the individual is a kind of illusion um, that we've moved to be primary in, in this kind of co contemporary sense, but really we are of, uh, of a collective and the individual is a kind of emergent property of the collective. So to try and to reform um, bonds that are longstanding, you spoke of like these relationships that you've had throughout your life that are now like, I mean, they become more the most precious things that you have. And to kind of reform and re-understand and revitalize the notion of marriage as kind of a revolutionary act where you are sealing off to the outside and you are protecting a zone where the forces of technology cannot penetrate, where the forces of uh, identity, you know, kind of what you were talking about earlier, Nina, about how identity is this kind of like thing out there that you like put on yourself and you contort yourself into this like out exterior form. Um, it's about presenting yourself to the world and about like kind of like almost curating a kind of celebrity or kind of brand like you push that out outside of your membrane and in and in the inside you have this like secret world that's kind of how I have been thinking about um, this notion of, of marriage yeah no I think that's really beautiful and actually I do I do agree that like in the in the age of kind of tinder and the algorithm deciding who you should date that actually um, to, to be loyal and, and, you know, I mean, to use Bajuian language, like to be faithful, if you like, have fidelity to an event, let's say the love event, you know, to, to be with someone, to decide actually to, you know, spend your life with somebody is, does actually now appear not, not so much domestic tyranny, but rather a radical revolutionary act. And I think even Zizek was making this point, you know, about 10, 15 years ago you know, rather than the kind of absolute, and you know, interchangeability of the other in which you're kind of constantly moving through random others, which I think kind of absolutely, um, you know, evacuates everybody of their uniqueness in a way. So, I mean, just to, to answer like Rachel's question about kind of contemporary thinkers, I mean, it, it occurs to me that really in a, a, of a piece with what we're saying, it's it's really my peers who I respect more. I mean, of course, there are kind of older figures who I, you know, admire, who are still alive, you know, including Agamben and Badu and, and others. But actually, the, the, I, I would say the most kind of interesting and, and moving discussions are with people who are, I don't know, I mean, more or less of similar cohort or younger, you know, that, that the act of thinking, I mean, the philosophical dialogue itself is what's important it's 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 maybe the older you get it's less about having a particular master or a particular figure that one follows and reads up but rather it's having the dialogue with particular people you know or it doesn't have to be two but yeah like we, we keep coming back to the dialogue and I think yeah absolutely the the esoteric aspect you know walking with your friend in nature and discussing Spinoza or something I mean you know what's more beautiful really than this <laughs> so yeah I think my my peers would be my favorite philosophers <laughs> today I think it's amusing that we're able to find peer groups like this I think of the CCRU and the UK and the Thai society and what people are doing right now and secret societies I mean they've been given a bad name by some people um, but what do you think is the end goal of a secret society? Is it a way to heretically communicate, to secede, to create a utopia? What What is the goal? I, I think it's just think? an exploration of those bonds itself. I mean, I think the, the act of mutually agreeing with other people to preserve a particular space, you know, you can think of it as a kind of... Uh, yeah, a secret society or a cartel or a dyad or a, a you know or a dialogic partner. You know, it, it, in a way, it's it's both closed and open. So, I mean, I think one of the things that I really you know noticed that was happening again over the past ten years, and and you know, one of the negative things I think that was happening in the in the the left, at least in London and the London art world and so on, was um, in a in a sense a kind of very abstract or even absent notion of friendship or loyalty like those things just kind of weren't there anymore there was a kind of dispensability of people you know where people had if they transgressed or said or did the wrong thing people were kind of 
um, you know, expelled increasingly in this kind of mechanism, um, as kind of scapegoat mechanism, and as if there was some other abstract world in which, uh, you know, the left was working towards, and it wasn't just a load of people, it wasn't just everyone who was there. And, I, and it just kind of became more and more obvious to me that, no, that, that we are all we have, you know, there, there isn't some other thing that we can dispense with each other in order to, you know, uh, be more in favour of. It's we have to work with each other. And, you know, to imagine that you can just kind of dispense with people in this way was actually extremely kind of destructive. So I kind of had a revelation about things like loyalty and friendship in a very real and concrete way and about the meaningfulness of those things. You know, these are not... Um, minor things these are absolutely kind of um crucial central things that actually sustain a life and a, and a you know a, a, a thoughtful existence um so yeah yeah how do you think that um alienation works its way into the history of men versus the history of women and um, how that shows up today with this kind of atomization process of of kind of living in a techno capitalist world yeah i think that's a really interesting question i mean i've been working a lot in the last two years on the um this question of of men rather than women <laughs> right so i've written this book called what do men want which is a kind of jokey reference to freud's question what does woman want and so i reposed it to, about men and and obviously there's been a lot of discussion about you know, a very negative discussion about men in the last few years, you know, these ideas of toxic masculinity and this idea that kind of men are somehow like, uh, I don't know, fatally or like awful thing, um, which has been kind of promulgated by very liberal media. Um, you know, at the same time, it, it also a kind of fear of, of, of uh, resurgence or a kind of particular kind of masculinity, which is then associated with the dissident right or the alt-right or incels or so on. So I kind of looked at all these sort of phenomena and the way in which they kind of play out in the discourse. And it, it actually ended up being a book about the relationship between men and women. Mm -hmm. So it's actually really in the end a book about how men and women get along and the kind of games and interactions that they have in a very mixed world. Because after all, our, our kind of contemporary world is a very heterosocial one, right? Which is to say not a heterosexual one, although sometimes it is that as well. But Primarily, it's a world in which men and women work together. They see each other on the street. It's not a segregated world. It's a very, very um, int intricate world, which has caused kind of a lot of problems and fears and anxieties, perhaps because there is so much proximity. Um, and, you know, particularly after things like Me Too, it's obvious that there uh, is a great deal of anxiety around things like sexual approaches. And, you know, I, I, lots of people used to meet their partner or their future wife or husband at work. And I think now, you know, many people would be extremely um, anxious uh, about, um, you know, any form of kind of flirtation or romantic interaction with people in a work environment. So there's a kind of, you know, a suspicion and a hostility that's kind of been um, really uh, exacerbated in the past few years. Um, and I tried to think about what it might mean to actually kind of reconcile in a kind of fun and playful way. Um, <laughs> so in terms of alienation, I suppose I'm interested in like, yeah, I, I guess actually probably like a collective project that would involve both men and women, you know, just in trying to work out exactly what's going on and how we can be together and how we can live together in this kind of complicated way. I'm not interested in it's, it's very complicated because I mean obviously I do think that men and women are different right I, you know I do think there are important differences but at the same time I think there is a collective social and intellectual and emotional and romantic and, and even friendship project that is possible you know and that indeed happens you know men and women are friends you know despite the <laughs> ideas to the contrary and so I do think there's a kind of shared um, a shared project which is actually quite beautiful and, and strange and interesting in, in that we can work out together, whether it's in marriage or friendship or, you know, collectively, socially. And in fact, I think we kind of have to do that. I think the idea that we're so opposed, you know, is, um, and that men are somehow, you know, irredeemably flawed is extremely untrue and extremely unhelpful. I don't, I don't think that is the, 
experience that most women have of most men, right? It's not to say that there aren't some terrible things that happen, right? And we're all capable of terrible things. We're all, we've all done harm. We've all hurt people. We've all upset people. We've all behaved badly. We've all said things that have, you know, you know, caused real damage. And the older you get, I think the more you learn to live with that and you understand that. And I think we live in a, a very weird post-Christian period in, in socially, which is to say we have the kind of almost like an Old Testament, you know, desire to punish each other, but without the forgiveness, you know. <laughs> so people are very, very kind of um, quick to say, well, this person did or said that, but they're much, much less uh, uh, amenable to forgiveness. And, and I think we can't really proceed without forgiveness. Right. It's not to say that we shouldn't recognize harm where it's where it's occurred. But I think, you know, we have often this kind of very cold vigilante understanding. And, and you know, obviously the Internet has become a very uh, brutal tool in the punishment and use circulation of names. If you want to accuse someone of something, you know, it's absolutely blunt. You don't know where your your accusation is going to end up. And it often does a lot of damage to people. So I try to look at all of these kinds of um things and and suggest a more kind of yeah like uh reconciled and playful and, and and intellectual and thoughtful way of being together that that does address alienation you know of different kinds i suppose i didn't read it <laughs> yeah so we'll see it really does um so we're kind of at the halfway point so if people want to throw chat uh questions in and we will look at your questions and uh, you can unmeet yourself and ask your question directly to Nina or, or me or, or Rachel um, but I wanted to I'm gonna want to keep kind of riffing on this um, what you just presented here which is like I think there seems to be a struggle with pluralism we seem to be struggling with the idea that there are different kinds of people who need different kinds of things and that maybe there would be pockets of people who would be appealing to certain people based on their certain kind of desire for those certain kinds of things. And there's a desire, like it seems for certain factions to devour preferences of other factions. And this seems to be the case with maybe something like the idea of like polyamory versus monogamy, right? Like there's this kind of war about like, you know, which mating strategy is better or dating strategy is better. And it's like, well, what about the possibility that for some people polyamory works and for some people monogamy works and that yeah. would be philosophical, intellectual, romantic, like cultures and movements that appeal to those two microcosms of, of existence and that the one needing to devour the other is, is like kind of a moot point. So what do you, what do you think about this, this like lack of, of pluralism that we have in the culture? Um. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think in practice, things are very pluralist. I think people do live in very different life worlds. And, you know, I mean, I, you know, I, I agree about poly polygamy and do I mean polygamy? Polyamory. <laughs> polygamy. <laughs> that, that polygamy, that's not generally engaged in many wise. But no, no, like polyamory. Yeah, I mean, I, I know some people in, who are into polyamory and, and you know, I, I kind of I understand what they're saying when they talk about it, you know, and they, they seem very rational and very kind of thoughtful and it's all very kind of discursive and it's all very, you know, worked out. Um, I mean, I think, I think the poetic, uh, you know, tragic side of me can't bear the idea of, of like having a, a Google spreadsheet type relationship to... <laughs> <laughs> to other people I'd rather suffer and like you know uh write poetry and be romantic and um you know so so I uh, in a way I don't yeah it's not for everybody right it's like people like you say I mean some people are more into monogamy some people are more into uh, you know polyamory I I don't particularly carry the way I mean I do think there are probably broader cultural comments we could make about um what what is kind of revealed in the popularity or why some people might be pushing things like polyamory you know is it a kind of um yeah kind there, of a Go on. this it is the cause um and I, my impression as another old left person is that they took causes and capitalized on them and they turned the cool, the big money image at every time um so 
how do you tell when something is organic now at all? Like for any social activist movements at all, like I got better from a social activism community, but I know like some people they just talk to their friends and, and not everybody in that community is bad, but there does seem to be like a, a shutdown of discussion. How, how would you like as an intelligent woman deal with these people in an effective way? I mean, I, well, I don't know. I mean, whether we're talking about this particular thing or not, I mean, I, I mean, one thing that just becomes clearer and clearer to me, the older I get and the further away I get from particular institutions and groups is, is in the first place, the absolute um, priority of thinking for oneself, you know, of preserving right. one's own mind, you know, and to actually ask yourself, whatever you're thinking about or reading or talking about, you know, to ask yourself in the first place, well, what do I think? You know, before you then start to think, oh, well, what does this person think? Or what should I think? Or what's the right thing to think? Or what are most people saying? You know, I mean, it's so basic, but it, I mean, it seemed to take me a really long time to learn this in certain ways. And I think there's also a kind of often like a female socialization thing, which is about being nice. And, you know, it's quite hard to resist that sort of training, um, you know, where you don't want to upset people <laughs> and actually sometimes saying what you think is going to cause um, upset um, and then asking that question of whether it's worth saying what you think because you know it's going to cause trouble or or keeping quiet becomes like quite um, a major one so I don't know I mean again I think this is just a, a sort of existential lesson that perhaps I learned as well and and also kind of recovering from being a you know quite hardcore alcoholic and then just waking up and going like oh my god what have I been doing for 20 years and <laughs> suddenly realizing in a way that even though I'd been kind of thinking and working and doing all this this stuff and you know whether it was you know writing essays or activism or whatever teaching that in a way some sort of basic things I hadn't quite articulated or grounded for myself which would be to do with this freedom to think independently first of all and I think because also the the sort of leftist project in a way depends upon a certain putting an abstract notion of the collective first as if you know the individual is not really relevant you know or that your feelings or thoughts are kind of secondary um, to whatever the, the group think is. And I think that's very common for almost any kind of dominant group in a way. Um, so to like reclaim your own mind, first of all, seems to be a major step. <laughs> yeah, I, I've, I've been feeling that way like very strongly because, you know, I think that there's so many, uh, maybe if we're being generous, like kind of archetypes or um, concepts of what it means to actualize that are being sold to you, essentially, um, mm -hmm. kind of competing for your attention. And so as an individual, it's hard to know what's yours and what's someone else's. And there's a kind of necessity to take on the question of becoming I think you, sp you spoke with that earlier with the kind of second wave feminist kind of notion of like becoming oneself, kind of arising into who you are throughout the entirety of your life cycle, you know, because that continuously transforms over the course of someone's life. And that continual becoming uh, and that introspective process, I think, is crucial for I mean, I think it's a political act. I literally like I really think it's a revolutionary political act to engage from oneself and to ask oneself and, and not in a solipsistic way. And I think maybe that's yeah. a good question because there's so much solipsism in a lot of like kind of new age thinking, like this kind of weird health guru thing. So how do we like turn into ourselves and, and really ask these difficult questions about who are we becoming without falling into the trap of, of sol solipsism and, and narcissism? No, sure. I mean, in a way, I think this capacity to think or like, you know, sort of re reasserting that basic empty category of thought is in a way it doesn't have necessarily have any even any content it's simply a potential it's like well i can think it's like i mean this is why philosophy is always going back to absolutely fundamental things or foundational questions constantly and in a way philosophy seems to me nothing other in, 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 on some level than the reposing endlessly of incredibly simple 
um, uh, you know, forms of openness and wonder to the very act of thinking itself. And, and that kind of always has to be borne in mind. So, so I would say even before this kind of content of like the self or particular things that one is thinking, it's to do with that kind of um, capacity itself. Um, and that's what that kind of needs to be kind of pres preserved or protected. And so, uh, I, mean, I, I don't know, in a weird way, I want to say like one is not even a self or not even an individual at that level. You know, it's, it's almost like the Cartesian thing of like, you know, it's like, okay, I think therefore I am, but it's not even, I mean, Descartes it even says too much. I, what he should say is there is, there is thinking, you know, that there is mm -hmm. thought happening and it's a kind of um, capacity. So, you know, I, I, I mean, I know what you mean and I think there's a lot of political resistance to the idea of individual thinking, you know, that actually needs to also be overcome. I mean, I also, um, you know, did psychoanalysis for three years and, and actually like, you know, I'm still in analysis and, and getting over that guilt of even talking about oneself as if there's anything interesting to say about it. And, and actually there both is and there isn't. It's kind of like, well, you're no more or less interesting than anyone or anything else, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in a way, it's not even about you. It's like whatever that means. It's kind of, you know, there is a, a, a process, there is a structure, there is a way in which you sort of ca came to be who you are or in the process of becoming. And there's actually something kind of very interesting about understanding that and actually that opens you up to the world again you know that it that it doesn't necessarily or hopefully become a narcissistic or solipsistic project but actually what it does is kind of break you away from those things precisely so that you can be more in the world and more with other people and more thoughtful and more expansive so i i think both philosophy and psychoanalysis if we want to say that have that as a, a kind of breaking open into the world you know, that it's not a confirmation. There's nothing positive necessarily about it. I mean, psychoanalysis is famously not there to make you feel better. You know, mm -hmm. it doesn't teach you how to be happy or anything like that. <laughs> Nor does philosophy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, great. Um, be happy, maybe you need to be more interesting. Speaking of interesting, I've been looking at some very interesting questions and comments in this chat. Um, Hel Kante, would you like to unmute yourself and read this question? Yeah, sure. Which one? Because I put a lot of them in there. Yeah, and no, the one uh, I was. Uh, you've worked. Yeah, you. you've worked with um. Uh, you've worked with Bado, uh, Nina, and uh, you've. Uh, I'm not sure. You've probably read loads of uh, Zizek and Hegel. But the question is, um, would you say almost because uh, you you were in the Bataille course and I was never really in the in the course for that. But uh, one example of uh, feminine femininity that is always referred to as the Antigone myth and that kind of conspiracy between Antigone and Ismane and I was just wondering like what you thought about like almost like what's the modern version of that or how how would that be interpreted in today's light especially given the fact that I know one of Ra one of our uh, things Raven talks about is the importance of motherhood whereas Antigone is traditionally seen as a figure who's kind of against the idea of motherhood and that's what she's trying to like almost be against by committing the act when she does um yeah no sure i mean there's loads of things to say about antigone and her relation to the state and to justice and so on i mean like i mean before his death recently bernard stiegler was talking about greta thunberg as a kind of antigone figure right so it's, i mean it's quite it's kind of quite strange i mean what whatever we think about about this idea but but you know the idea of kind of um the the female figure opposing if you like the kind of um you know it we in anger like it's a particularly um effective mode of being right to oppose the the state law and to say that there are laws that are more important or there are kind of um, forms of justice that are more important than the laws of the the state you know so mm -hmm. antigone is positioned always as this kind of figure who you know in her desire to bury her brother you know, and, and to kind of perform these burial rites against what she's ordered to do. And she'll do that at the risk and cost of her own extinction because that's what she's committed to. So it's a kind of, um, you know, she's a kind of heroic figure, obviously, in this way, you know, and she poses the possibility of a kind of thought and being outside of what, we're, what the laws are, what we're supposed to do. Um, 
no and in that sense she's kind of like a perennial figure of thought and being you know that 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 you know exists as a possibility for for anyone in a way or not for anyone but i mean potentially for anyone like can anyone be antigone perhaps you know it's like a possibility um in particular circumstances perhaps so i mean what i mean one thing i suppose that maybe is quite lacking today in many ways is a kind of idea of tragedy you know we live in a world that's kind of obviously very technocratic technological progressive in lots of ways very positivistic very scientific you know that that even in the face of a kind of global pandemic and what could be an opportunity to rethink um, values and death in particular. I mean, this is kind of, again, what Agamben was, was saying, that, that actually it's, it still remains at the level often of a very, uh, you know, statistical, political, technocratic discourse, right? There hasn't necessarily been a rethinking or opening up of these deeper questions about the value of life and death, you know, and the, and the reality of, of death, you know, I mean, there, when we talk about extinction and the possibility environmentally or globally in, in relation to some, you know, like a, like the pandemic, of course, it raises this question of human extinction. Um, you know, are we re able as a society to think about about tragedy and about fate in the same way that the Greeks might might have done. I don't think so. You know, tragedy seems to have disappeared in, into, you know, it seems to have dissolved, right, into this kind of technocratic image of death in which death is simply another hygienic possibility for being, you know, and it's kind of hidden away. Um, so, I mean, figures like Antigone perhaps point to a different relation to death, right? I mean, of course they do you know, to, to, to want to, to and, and again, Agamben talked about burial rights. He was very, very opposed to the idea that people would no longer be able to bury their dead and to be there in ritual ways, you know, in ceremonial ways. So, yeah. Yes, no sacrifice. Yeah, exactly. As you say. Uh, yeah, to write in ritual and also the, the banning of those that came before you, not you, but like the general act of people starting something together that they're really passionate about. And then new people come in that don't really get it, but they're just really good at mimicry and they work their way up, you know? Um, and academia, did you ever feel like these people were against you or did you just find a way to get along with them did you play the game like how do you how do you operate in that frame um yeah well I mean I was a lecturer for 13 years um <laughs> I mean I think things shifted once the because obviously we had the fee regime in Britain that you know so the fee we lost the battle to stop the fees becoming very high so they were nine thousand pounds a year so students were ending up with in fifty thousand pounds worth of debt you know more like the American model and, um, you know, I, I, I think it became, I mean, you know, where I was teaching was not an elite institution. So my students were often coming from working class backgrounds and they were often um, working while they were studying. And the cost in every mm -hmm. sense of doing a degree was, was very high. And the anxiety that it, would, it was inducing was very, very high. And I, and I felt that it became harder and harder and, and less moral to be a teacher in that environment, you know, to actually support this system um, of mass debt, um, you know, you know, the mass induction of debt uh, in, a, in a system in which people were not going to get jobs that were worthy of their intellect, in fact, following the, the, their degree. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I was never really, I mean, I'm sort of, yeah, I was a good academic in some ways and a really bad academic in other ways. I think most academics are personally very socially conservative, even if they work on like, you know, revolutionary stuff or whatever. They're actually very, um, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, careful um, about how they behave because a lot of people don't, obviously don't want to lose their job. Um, so they, they, you know, I think academia became very inhibited and we see that more and more like, I think there's a lot of fear in academia of speaking about particular issues and a lot of academics just keep their head down, which isn't very 
good for a productive intellectual environment right like you what you want is people who are free to to think and to, to speak and to do work that might actually you know tell you things that people don't want to know you know to push the boat out to 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 actually yeah say dangerous and difficult things not just for the sake of it but because they might be true um you know and i think that that became harder and harder for for everybody um, and i do think contemporary academia is over I, I think those institutions many of them are going to fall they're going to collapse as a result of covid but they were already kind of over um in many many ways ideologically because they were kind of um screwed um you know because of this kind of fear and the dominance of particular ways of speaking and i don't think it was kind of everywhere but it was it was getting bad definitely um, and students themselves were becoming afraid to speak in seminars. You know, I really noticed this as the years went on. They, they were afraid in case they said the wrong thing and that they would get punished by their peers. And a lot of students were on, you know, quite a lot of antidepressants. They were often, you know, in very bad mental states, really. Um, and it was really quite sad and awful to see that. And there was very little really you can do as a, you know, random lecturer about that. So there was a kind of general negative climate um i would say and so the question then becomes what what comes after and i think after a plague there's usually like a renaissance you know a cultural renaissance so i think a lot of the old institutions whether they're academic or artistic or whatever all of these big things a lot of them are going to have to radically change or they're going to fall apart and people are going to start doing much more of their own thing um and i actually think and i think maybe justin makes this argument that the elites are actually going to abandon a lot of the elite, elite institutions and set up their own as well. You know, that actually they'll just hand them over um, to people who and give chair, random meaningless chairs and positions to people in order to appear gracious and woke. <laughs> but actually they're going to carry on doing their own thing elsewhere. So, yeah. We have a good question from Dan. We actually have a few questions from Dan Feldman in the chat. Dan, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Um, sure, but uh, can you copy one of the questions? I don't, I haven't been sure. following Raven. I have questions. Which one did you like best? Um, I think that this one, where would you expect this discourse to open up to the more metaphysical approach? is interesting and then also the one before which was oh jealousy is related to fear and there are cognitive press practices that can dissolve fear but this is a side discussion in some way to the discussions of polyamory i think the more interesting question is this what needs are people attempting to meet by participating in polyamory versus pairing versus aestheticism what are the biggest underserved needs in this meeting crisis you want to riff on that and then we can interview yeah that's i think you did just We'll just go, you, you did well. Thank you. <laughs> um, Nina, I'll, I'll repost the question if you want to look at no, it. No, no, I can see them. I can see them. I'll oh, scroll okay. back up. Um, yeah, I mean, they're two slightly different ones. I don't know, Dan, would you want to sort of focus on, on one? Um, I, I mean, I, I guess, uh, to riffing off of your comments that that we've lost the sense of tragedy in society i mean it's it's to me it's an aesthetically um blind ignorant dumb society where 80 percent of what it means to be human is not reflected in in the minds and the souls of the people running the society um and i would argue that that's a lack a lack of you know, considering philosophical or metaphysical issues to begin with. Um, <laughs> trying to tie this together into a question. Um, well, okay, here, here's the question. Uh, you're mentioning that the academia and the universities are sort of collapsing and there's going to be probably some kind of a, a, f a flight from them into what I'm starting to see, and I'm wondering if you're starting to see this, is some kind of embedded uh, learning ecosystems where mm -hmm. learning institutions, perhaps completely unrelated to the historical learning institutions, will start, seed forms will start appearing and they will be embedded tightly into the community and it, it'll be a more 
organic form, a more organic, complex, uh, emergent form of learning and education that is focused, I'm hoping, on actually solving the problems that the old system created. And I'm wondering if you have any, any thoughts or ideas or whether you're seeing anything in that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, I think people want to learn and talk to each other. I mean, you know, like on, on some level, we have access, you know, if you have access to the internet, to the, the entire history of existing texts, right? I mean, that you know, it's possible to get hold of everything that's more or less that's been kind of preserved of human production, right? So on some level, like there's a kind of immense richness of things that can be revisited, read together, discussed, and so on. And I think... Yeah, I mean, I think people have always spontaneously organized or taught themselves and, you know, thought together in, you know, autodidactic ways or kind of working class ways or, you know, so I think I mean, that's not going to stop. I mean, I think obviously the technology does allow for kind of multiple platform use in different ways. And, you know, I mean, it, it's going to it's going to be interesting how much people can meet in person you know i mean i think we're probably heading into another lockdown here as well i mean not not clear exactly yet but I, it's you know those sorts of things are maybe you know clearly be becoming much more pressurized and people have lot you know completely different attitudes to whether they are want to be outside with other people or not like there's a really huge psychological difference in how people react anxiously or, or otherwise to these um rules or laws it's not even clear what they are um <laughs> and so yeah i mean i think i think there will be all of these kind of uh, as you say like learning ecosystems um that are more community based i think i think you're yeah you're going to get more like patchworks of different kind of intellectual desires i mean you already do like in forums and and so on you know people are kind of drawn all over the place right so th those ways of mapping what interests people I mean, I think, I mean, the kind of more boring institutional question would be like, what happens to accreditation, right? Because obviously people can run around learning whatever they like, you know, and that's great. And often people are highly motivated to do that much more so than if they think they have to get a degree in order to do something else. But, you know, when, if institutions kind of collapse and then you just end up with lots more para-academic or kind of semi-academic things, then the question of like accreditation then becomes an issue. Like, what is a degree worth? Is it worth anything? you know, does it matter if you have one or not? I mean, what, what are there even any jobs? Is there a kind of economy that in which that would make sense anymore? Um, and I think those are like perhaps massive and really difficult to answer questions at this point. Um, but I think in the meantime, the desire to know and to learn will absolutely, um, you know, persist. And I, I think people will, yeah, more and more realize that they are capable, you know, that it's possible to do th these things. I mean, People were mocking people for starting podcasts during the um, the lockdown, but actually, I think like why not? I mean, why not? People have podcasts to discuss whatever they want, and if people are interested in the same things, they can listen to that podcast. And maybe every podcast will have like one or two listeners. But but why not? This is like this is already very beautiful. Like not everything has to appeal to the largest number of people all the time. It's never going to. You know, people make their own kind of worlds and communities and secret societies, you know, <laughs> so. Yeah, definitely. And uh, Estella is kind of one of those. Examples. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a really, you know, impressively organized one. I mean, given the, the, the range of speakers you have, it's incredible, no? Yeah, I always welcome that opinion. You know, you're, you're one of us. I actually wanted to ask you uh, about embodiment. I know it's very big in these communities to discuss embodiment, but I also know um, as someone who's also studied Mark Fisher and Nick Lanz, uh, there is a lot of disembodied philosophy that is directly engaging with the mind and not the body. And I'm curious if you well, get crap from other women for like having philosophers you like that aren't embodied enough and just this kind of like male female energy dynamic does, does this kind of thing go on with your peers and how, how does that work um i i don't know i mean i don't i don't think there's too too much of that kind of um criticism going on i mean i i, 
I don't know. I mean, I, I suppose just just personally, it, it was a kind of revelation to like get fit and work out and mm. and realize like how much mentally better I felt, <laughs> mm. and that this was actually very positive for my you know philosophical thinking as well. You know, and it's actually kind of interesting to reflect on that kind of relationship between mind and body in that way, um, just on some very basic personal level, I suppose, and and you know to revisit someone like Spinoza, for example, you know, who says like thought and extension are basically two different ways of looking at the same thing. You know, there, there, there's a kind of parallelism, you know, it's a very different, it's not kind of mind body splits that then needs to be put back together. It's the, you know, it's a slightly different way of understanding the, the two, you know, as, as one in a certain way, you know, that they're kind of the same thing, just seen under different attributes. And yeah, so I, so I, just, I don't know. I mean, I think, yeah, I wonder what's what's going on with the embodiment discussion at the moment. I mean, it, certainly there's kind of lots of questions about how disembodied people are, like the virtual, the you know, the online. You know, I mean, when I was doing the research about masculinity and, and men, obviously the kind of question of like men working out came up a lot. You know, the, the kind of uh, big celebration of kind of uh, gym, you know, going to the gym and working out and, and that kind of thing. Um, you know came up a lot and it and it was actually very very interesting and i kind of defend that in the book um as it were uh, you know to say well why why how is it not a positive thing that people that men look after their bodies rather than like lie around eating chips and watching porn you know surely it's a good thing that people <laughs> take care of themselves you know it's better for for everyone uh, that people are fitter right and and you know go outside and so I don't know I mean it's um on the kind of male female question yeah I I don't know I think I think I'm suspicious of people who would um be critical of being healthy and fit I think there's sometimes a little bit of a negative attitude towards that um on the left and and in particular and uh that's wrong I'm against that <laughs> Yeah. Well, Nina, we're kind of at the hour. Mm -hmm. and I am so grateful that you could come and join us and discuss all of these myriad topics. It's been a really wonderful conversation. No worries. Yeah, it's been amazing. And uh, do you have any, just any final words, any things we should be looking out for in your in your sphere, things that you're doing, conversations you're having? Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm starting to to think I'm doing this course on the philosophy of risk, which is the next kind of big topic I'm kind of thinking about. Um, and that was in relation partly to the pandemic. It was partly this question, as I was saying, about different people's uh, psychological attitudes, you know, like actually how do human beings calculate their own relation to risk and probability? So I wanted to actually start, you know, I'm teaching this course, it's an adult ed course in the UK. Um, about these kind of questions right so so because it, it struck me as very interesting that you had in some situations you could see people being very author authoritative or even authoritarian about the rules but sometimes they would break the rules and and actively break the rules like to go on a black lives matter protest it because they valued that more right so you had this kind of often like really massive sea change in people's perspective and evaluation of their own relation to risk or the collective risk so I wanted to then just go through like those concepts in this course. So yeah, that's one big thing I'm working on. And yeah, the finishing the man book, basically just doing the final edits and probably writing more controversial articles <laughs> for the Telegraph because I need to make some money uh, defending <laughs> JK Rowling and the right to write fiction about whatever she wants and anyone wants. And, uh, you know, getting lots of people sending me horrible gore pictures and nasty messages but it's fine you know people can do that too if they like <laughs> so well, yeah to when your book is released i think it'll be a nice uh, jumping off point for many more yeah hopefully next year at some point it takes a while because it's like a big publisher and i can't just put it out in a week like the other thing that the that rachel was reading from before <laughs> mm, sure. very diy yeah. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Nina. And uh, we'll see you around the stoa. Yeah. <laughs> All thank right. You, well, thank you, Nina. I, I couldn't answer all the questions. There are lots of things coming up and uh, uh, I didn't imagine. 
Come back. Yeah. We'll, we'll answer some more. Yes, I'll come back again. Great. All right. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to just uh, inform people about some future events that are coming up at the STOA. It's going to be a pretty fascinating week. We have coming right up, uh, Meta Modern Masculinity, a good pair to this conversation that we're having here about uh, femininity with Aaron Rogerson. That's September 20th at 6 p.m. Eastern time. Highly recommend those conversations. I've been watching them and they're very engaging. Then also we have the fourth political theory with Alexander Dugan. That's on the 21st at noon Eastern time. And that day we have stacked, right? So we have taking his thoughts wherever they go with Derek Jensen right after that. That's gonna be at 4 p.m. Eastern time. And then Unity 2020 with Brett Weinstein gonna be at 6.30 p.m. that day. Uh, and there's so much more. So please check the website, thestoa.ca to get a look at all of the future events coming up here at the STOA. And thank you all so much for being here. Much gratitude.